All right, so we're starting section 3.3 now, and we're working on um, deriving the derivatives of our six trigonometric functions. That's sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, and cotangent. And uh, our way of approaching this is going to be first finding the derivatives of the sine and cosine functions. And then since the other four trigonometric functions can all be represented in terms of sines and cosines, we can use those results to find the other derivatives we're looking for. Um, however, before we can even get into the derivatives of sine and cosine, there's a couple of limits that we need to um, prove first, because these will show up as we try and establish those derivatives. Um, so starting with this one, uh, the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x, that's equal to 1. Now, this you cannot evaluate this by direct substitution because uh, the denominator would be equal to zero. Notice the numerator would also be equal to zero. And as we have seen, when you're taking the limit as x approaches some number of a quotient, if direct substitution gives you zero over zero most of the time, that is a limit that exists, but you can't evaluate it using direct substitution. You have to take some other approach. This second limit here will also show up, and this is a similar case. Limit as x approaches 0 of cosine of x minus 1 over x is equal to 0. Can't evaluate that using direct substitution either for the same reason as this one. So our goal, even though I've stated both of these limits, is to actually prove them. Um, and in doing so, for the first time, we're going to make a geometric argument for a limit. The reason this is necessary is because we define both the sine and the cosine functions in trigonometry using the unit circle. And so the unit circle would naturally show up in this process of trying to prove either of these. Um, <clears throat> so let's, let's consider this diagram here. This is a, a little part of our unit circle. Um, and there's three figures to be paying attention to here. First of all, is uh, we've, we've decided on an angle x here. And I'm intentionally keeping x in the first quadrant of our unit circle. In trigonometry, we learned that the angle x uh, takes us to a point on the unit circle, and the coordinate of those points we define to be cosine of x for the x value and sine of x for the y value. But uh, if that's the case, then if I were to construct this right triangle, and you do a lot of this in trigonometry, the base of this right triangle would be that x-coordinate, cosine of x. And the height of that right triangle would be the y-coordinate of that point, sine of x. Okay. So the first figure that we want to pay attention to is this smaller right triangle right here, A, B, E. Um, the next thing we want to pay attention to is the sector of this uh, unit circle that's highlighted in green here. And uh, that's just the sector of the unit circle subtended by the angle x. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. And then finally, we have this larger right triangle right here. And this right triangle comes from taking the radius uh, that we've drawn in this diagram, the radius of our unit circle, and extending it beyond the point B until we get to this point F. And F is the point of intersection between that extended radius and the line that is tangent, the vertical line that is tangent to the unit circle at the point 1, 0. Okay? Notice this creates another right triangle. Now the base of this right triangle is the same as the radius of my unit circle. I can see it goes from A to D or 0 to 1, so the base of that right triangle would be 1. Notice that the height is given as tangent, and uh, we're going to show where that came from really quick. So it's important to note that the two right triangles that are showing up in this diagram are similar triangles. Notice, uh, if you remember from geometry or trigonometry, we talk about this too, in order for two triangles to be similar, what you need is at least two of their angles to be congruent, um, because that would imply that the third angle, angle is necessarily congruent in order for all the angles to add up to 180 in each triangle. Um, the smaller right triangle has a 90 degree angle and x. This larger right triangle also has a 90 degree angle and x. So they, these two triangles each have two congruent angles, which means they're similar. 
And as we know, similar triangles, when you compare their sides, are proportional. So if I wanted to compare uh, the sides of the smaller right triangle to the sides of the larger right triangle, let's temporarily call this U so that the height of this right triangle is just taking on that label U because we're pretending we don't know that it's tangent right now. Using the proportional relationship between the small right triangle and the larger one, I can take the height or altitude of the smaller triangle over the base, so that would be sine of x over cosine of x, and then I could uh, set that equal to the altitude of this right triangle over its base. So that would be u over, and remember we said that this base is equal to one, right? u over 1. Of course, u over 1 is just u. Anything over 1 is itself. And sine of x over cosine of x, by definition, is tangent of x. So tangent of x is equal to this thing u. That's where we're getting that from. By the way, this is where the word tangent comes from. Um, you may have talked about this in trigonometry, or you may not have, but uh, I, could pr I could show you a more complete diagram that shows how all six trig functions relate to this angle in the uh, in the unit circle, but uh, right now I really only need the tangent function. Um, we call this, we call the function tangent of x tangent because it corresponds to the length of this side, which is tangent to the unit circle. So that name has an actual meaning. All right, um, so continuing on with this diagram, you'll notice the relationship between these three um, these three figures is that we have a small right triangle that's completely contained inside this green sector of the unit circle, and that green sector of the unit circle is completely contained in this larger right triangle. So if we were to look at the areas of these three figures, then we have an inequality we could make out of that. We could say that the area of triangle ABE is less than or we could even say less than or equal to, to keep things even more general, less than or equal to the area of this sector, which is less than or equal to the area of triangle AFD. Okay, now what are those areas? Well, the area of this right triangle, the small one, is one half times the base times the height, or one half times cosine of x sine of x. Down here I wrote it the other way around, but one half times sine of x times cosine of x. So this guy right here is the area of the smaller right triangle. How do you find the area of a sector of a circle? Area of sector. Um, in any circle, the area of a sector is given by this formula. A equals 1 half theta r squared, where theta is the angle that we're using to get that sector, and r is the radius of the circle that we're cutting that sector out of. Of course, because we're talking about a unit circle here, the radius would be equal to one, so this is one squared or just one, and the angle theta we're calling x. So this area is just equal to one half x, okay? That's what's showing up in the middle. <clears throat> this larger right triangle, AFD, has a base of 1 and a height of tangent, so its area would be 1 half base times height, or 1 half tangent of x. What I'm going to do is work with this inequality and uh, simplify the expressions in here. First of all, I can multiply everything by 2 to eliminate those 1 halves, giving me this. I also converted my tangent of x to sine of x over cosine of x. The next thing I could do is divide everything by sine of x. Now, because we're in the first quadrant, remember I assumed that we're, we're in the first quadrant here, I know that sine of x would be positive. So dividing by sine of x is not going to flip any of these signs around. Um, <clears throat> okay. Now, the next thing that's going to happen is uh, I am going to... Uh, let's see, so we've gotten here. Okay, so cosine of x is less than or equal to x over sine of x, which is less than or equal to 1 over cosine of x. Um, I actually did make a mistake here, but I'm going to fix that. So from here to here, I'm taking the reciprocal of each of these. And if you have an inequality where both sides of the inequality are positive, which is the case for all of this, if you take the reciprocal of both sides, an inequality will flip around on you. 
So really this should say greater than or equal to. We'll fix that here. Okay. It doesn't really matter in the long run because we end up getting the same result. What I have here is a function of x trapped between two other functions of x. Now, what I want to do up in this diagram is I want to imagine x approaching 0, but from the positive side, from the right. What that would look like if x is approaching 0, it looked like I'm bringing this radius, that uh, b. Or I, uh, sorry, it would look like I'm taking point b and having an approach point D down here. So bringing it along the unit circle so that the radius of this thing is collapsing down to the x-axis, shrinking everything to zero. Um, the reason an x is approaching zero from the right and not from the left is because, again, if x was approaching zero from the left, then x would be negative, which means I would be in the fourth quadrant. Um, so we have to be careful about that. I'm going to take the limit as x approaches zero from the positive side of the outside functions, one over cosine of x and cosine of x. Now, both of these functions are continuous at zero. And so evaluating a limit is just a, the same thing as plugging zero directly in to both of these. And it's straightforward to see that if you did that, each of these functions gives me one, okay? So this is where we can use our squeeze theorem. And I can say that because the limit is zero approaches, the limit as x approaches zero from the right, on these outside functions is equal to one, then the squeeze theorem would tell me that this function in the middle also has a right-hand limit of one. So that's this right here. What I want though is the limit as x approaches zero of this sine of x over x equal one, not just the right-hand limit. So we wanna confirm that the left-hand limit would do the same. And this is going to happen because this function is an even function. And uh, to show that, if we let x approach 0 from the left, and uh, we're taking that the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of sine of x over x, we can make a variable substitution where I can define y equal to negative x, which implies that x is equal to negative y. Um, and then I could uh, also note that if I made that variable substitution, y is going to be approaching 0 from the right as x approaches 0 from the left. Because remember, if x is approaching 0 from the left, we're thinking of x as you know, negative, but if y is equal to the opposite of x, that would imply that y is positive, okay? In addition to that, we could make some substitutions in our limit. So I have the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of sine of x over x, which is the same thing as the limit as y approaches 0 from the right, based on what we just said, of sine of negative y over negative y. There's our substitutions. Sine is an odd function, so I can pull the negative out and then these negatives cancel, giving me the limit as y approaches zero from the right of sine of y over y. We already proved, using that geometric argument, that this limit is equal to one. So we have our left-hand limit also coming out to one, which means the two-sided limit is equal to one. Okay, I know that was kind of a lengthy argument, but we need this result. And now that we've done that, the rest of this is gonna come out fairly straightforward. Um, the other limit we wanted to talk about was this one. The limit as x approaches 0 of cosine of x minus 1 over x. What I'm doing here is I'm multiplying by the conjugate of my numerator, cosine plus 1 over cosine plus 1. When I do that, my numerator comes out to cosine squared of x minus 1, and then my denominator, notice I'm, I'm leaving in factored form. Um, <clears throat> this, I could use my Pythagorean identity. So cos cosine squared of x minus 1 is equal to negative sine squared of x. Then what I'm going to do is pull this thing apart into a product of two rational expressions instead of just one. So the negative up here, I'm going to pull it all the way outside of the limit. I have a limit law allowing me to do that. Sine squared of x, that's sine of x times sine of x. I'm going to take one of those sines as well as this x in the denominator and pull them out into their own factor out here. That would leave me with another sine of x on top and a cosine of x plus 1 on the bottom down here. Now that I have a product of two functions, I have a limit law that allows me to bring this limit into each one of these independently. We just proved that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x is equal to 1. Applying that negative to that, and I get negative 1. Here, this function is continuous at 0, so I can use direct substitution. Sine of 0 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1, so 1 plus 1 down here gives me 2. 0 over 2 is 0 and then negative one times zero is zero. So that's what we were trying to show, that the limit as x approaches zero of cosine of x minus one over x equals zero, okay? 
I know it took a long time to get through those limits, and that's it's important that we did that because, again, we need both of those limits when evaluating the derivatives of our sine and cosine functions. But now that we have done that, I want to hold off a little bit longer on dealing with the derivatives that we are after in this section and see what I can use these limits for aside from that one application. Um, it turns out that knowing these limits uh, that we just proved are helpful in um, evaluating other kind of similar looking limits. So here we have another case where we want to evaluate the limit as theta approaches zero of sine of four theta over nine theta. And it's tempting to look at this and think that looks so similar to uh, this limit right here. It must be one, but it's not one because notice it's not exactly the same. The argument in my sine function and the uh, denominator in this function are identical, x and x. Here, they are not identical. I have a four theta and a nine theta. The goal in evaluating this limit is going to try to is going to be trying to get the denominator of this uh, quotient to match what I have in the argument for my sine function, and here's how we do that. This is equal. What I want this to look like. I need a limit first. Limit is theta approaches zero. Here's what I want this to look like. Sine of four theta over four theta, because then what I'm gonna do is make a variable substitution. But I can't just change a nine into a four. I have to do something algebraically that allows me to, I have to make an algebraically valid move here. So notice if I were to take this function, uh, this expression here, and multiply it by four ninths, then if I were to try and take this back a step, these fours would cancel, and I'd have nine theta in the denominator again. Right, so this is this expression is equal to this one, but the benefit of this is that now this expression is something I can work with. So what I'm going to do is set um, x equal to four theta. So x goes to zero as theta goes to zero, which is easy to see. Uh, if theta is approaching zero, then four times theta is still going to zero. So with that substitution, I get to rewrite this. This is the limit as x approaches zero of sine of x over x times four ninths, okay? <clears throat> now, because I have a product, I can evaluate the limit of each of these separately and multiply the results. We already know now that the limit as x approaches zero of sine of x over x is one, and four ninths being a constant is still gonna stay four ninths. So I get four ninths as a result, okay? Um, in chapter four, I've mentioned this in a previous section, but in chapter four, we'll talk about a different way of evaluating limits like this that's actually easier. And again, that's called L'Hopital's rule. We don't have enough background to do that yet. So um, for now, this is one way of handling limits like this one. Let's try another one. Here I have the limit as x approaches zero of sine of x over tangent of x. And what I'm gonna do is rewrite this as the limit as x approaches zero of sine of x over sine of seven x over cosine of x, okay, so seven uh, x. So I'm just using the definition of tangent here, okay? Of course, this is the same thing as the limit as x approaches zero of uh, sine of x over sine of seven x times cosine of seven x. So, you know, dividing by uh, a fraction is like multiplying by its reciprocal, which is the same as what I have here. Now this expression doesn't quite look like what we've been working with. What I would prefer to have here is a sine of x over x. Notice I could do something like this. This is equal to the limit as x approaches zero of sine of x over x times seven x over sine of seven x times cosine of seven x. Now, just to make a note of what I've done here, if you see a, a step like this where I make an expression look more complicated than the previous step, 
you want to see if you can go back a step when simplifying to get this result. And we can't quite do that because there's something else I need to add to this. But um, notice if I were to multiply these two expressions together, the x's would cancel each other back out again. The issue though is that I have a seven here that's unaccounted for. So if I were to multiply by one more thing, a 1 seventh, that would cancel that seven out. And since 1 seventh is a constant, I can even bring it straight out of the limit. So now 1 seventh times seven is one, those cancel, x and x, these would cancel, and this would all take me back a step. The benefit of doing this though is that these two expressions both look like uh, the, the limit that we used up here and that we've proven on the previous page. Okay, now this is this one doesn't quite look that way because it's a reciprocal. Um, however, I'm not going to walk through an argument for this just to save a little bit of time. But um, actually, no, I, I could do that. Remember back here when we did our uh, our what do you call it? Our squeeze theorem. I had sine of x over x, and then I showed that both of these go to one as x goes to one. So by the squeeze theorem. Or sorry, as x approaches 0 from the positive side. So by the squeeze theorem, sine of x over x would go to 1 as well. But notice here, I could have applied the squeeze theorem at this previous step and gotten the same result. So the reciprocal, x over sine of x, would still have the same limit uh, as sine of x over x as... Um, as x approaches 0 from the positive side. And then I could pretty easily show that that actually applies in the two-sided case as well. So this expression will go to 1 as x goes to 0, just like sine of x over x will. Okay. Now, in order to evaluate this guy right here, I would also be making another variable substitution like I did in the previous step. But uh, the end result would simply be that this goes to 1 as x goes to 0. So now evaluating everything, I have this 1 seventh. This limit here is equal to 1. This limit here is equal to 1. And then this limit here, cosine of 7x, is continuous everywhere. So I can substitute that 0 directly in times, uh, this would be uh, cosine of 7 times 0, which is cosine of 0, which is equal to 1. So this whole thing comes out to just 1 seventh. Okay? I'm going to try one more, and then we'll wrap this video up. So now, I'm looking at the limit uh, as x approaches 0 of 1 minus secant of x over 2x. So for this guy, let's do this down here, actually. I'm going to start by multiplying the numerator and denominator by cosine of x. Okay? And this is, I'm doing this because secant of x is the reciprocal of cosine. So when I multiply cosine to secant, I'm going to get a 1. Um, but I'll also get a cosine here. So this is going to look like cosine of x minus 1 over 2x cosine of x. Okay? And now... Um, I'm, lo I'm seeing something that looks a little bit like the, f the second limit that I proved, uh, this guy, cosine of x minus 1 over x. So I would like to rewrite this so that, that that exact expression shows up somewhere. Limit as x approaches 0 of cosine of x minus 1 over x. Notice I didn't account for the 2 or that cosine of x there, so I'm going to pull that out as a separate factor. Okay, now that I've done that, I can, mul I can bring the limit in to each of these. So the limit of this guy we showed was equal to 0. This guy is continuous at 0, so I could plug 0 directly in, and I get 1 over 2 times 1, or 1 half. But 0 times anything is just 0. Okay, um, we'll go ahead and start moving into the topic of derivatives in the next video.